This video covers the Cydians, often known as sea squirts, like this beautiful colony of Botryloides diagensis with blood cells circulating between the zoids. Ascidians are all benthic as adults. You'll note that I put Ascidians in quotes. That's because that group is paraphyletic with respect to Thaliaceans, a group of pelagic chordates that include pyrosomes, salps, and doliolids. Molecular phylogenies show that the Thaliaceans are nested within the sea squirts, but the word ascidian is still commonly interpreted as meaning the benthic sea squirts, and that's how I'll use it. Ascidians can be found in most benthic habitats, but they're particularly common in fowling communities like this one in Alminos Bay. The white cylindrical animals with two openings at one of their ends are members of the ascidian genus Siona, which is particularly nice to look at since the tunic is often very translucent. The tunic is thin and translucent. Right underneath it, running along the animal's long axis, you can see a few longitudinal muscles, which shorten the body when they contract. On the anterior end, there are two openings called siphons. The larger of the two is the oral siphon, which is really the animal's mouth. That leads into a huge pharynx that is perforated with lots of holes, or gill slits. Those gill slits are covered with cilia that pump water into the pharynx. Water passes through the gill slits and exits via the atrial siphon. You can see particles being sucked into the oral siphon here. Under the tunic of the oral siphon, you can see circular muscle fibers, which close the siphon when they're contracted. If you label the water with fluorescein, it's easy to see that flow pattern. Into the oral siphon, through the pharynx, and out the atrial siphon. The ventral edge of the pharynx bears a strand of glandular tissue called the endostyle. This is where the animal secretes a mucus net for feeding. That net moves over the left and right sides of the pharynx, and along with any particles trapped on it, gets coiled up into a cylinder on the dorsal edge of the pharynx. I fed this animal red particles, and so you can see that cylinder of captured food and net on the dorsal edge of the pharynx. Outside of the pharynx, dorsal to it, you can see the rectum filled with fecal pellets. I fed this animal red particles, then filmed it for about an hour and a half, which is how long it took for the first of those particles to make it all the way through the digestive system.
To see the digestive system and other internal structures in more detail, we can dissect an anesthetized animal open. The easiest way to do that is to cut down the ventral edge, cutting open the tunic and the pharynx. Here's what that looks like in Cyana intestinalis, another species in the genus that occurs here in Long Beach. Here it is pinned out. Here's the oral siphon. Here's the large pharynx, the esophagus leading into the stomach, the yellow stomach, and the intestine leading into the rectum, and the anus, which is that little bump. Here's the pharynx in more detail. The oral siphon is top right. We're looking right into the inner surface of the pharynx, and you can see that it looks like a mesh. On the right, you can see the endostyle on the ventral edge of the pharynx. The pharynx is very long. It fills most of the body of the animal. If you look more closely at the dorsal inner edge of the pharynx, you can see these finger-like structures protruding into the pharynx. Those are the dorsal linguettes, which form that cylinder of net and captured food on the dorsal edge of the pharynx. If you look at the left or right walls of the pharynx, you can see that it's covered with smaller protrusions, which are the normal linguettes. And here's the opening of the esophagus, which leads to the stomach. We can see that pharynx from another perspective in a cross section. The faintly staining thick layer on the outside of this section is the tunic. Right below it are the cut ends of lots of longitudinal muscles. Then there's a huge space, most of which is filled with the pharynx. The space inside the pharynx is, well, inside the pharynx. The space outside of it, but within the tunic, is the atrium. That cylinder with particles in it at the bottom of the section is a cross-section of the intestine or some other part of the digestive system. Here you can see the whole pharynx. Here's a higher magnification view of the tunic with those cut ends of longitudinal muscles just inside of it. This is the endostyle in cross-section at the very ventral edge of the pharynx. That is the organ that secretes the mucus net for feeding. That net slowly moves over both the left and right sides of the pharynx, catching food as water passes through it, and then it gets rolled up into a cylinder on the dorsal edge of the pharynx. The wall of the pharynx has infoldings on either side, probably to increase surface area so they can pump more water and catch more food. If you zoom in on the pharynx wall, you can see the normal linguettes protruding into the pharynx.
And if you zoom in even more, you can see that the wall of the pharynx has lots of tiny holes in it. Those are the gill slits. Something else you probably noticed earlier is the translucent pulsing object at the posterior end of this animal. That's the heart, which is long and cylindrical. The heart in Ascidians reverses its direction of beat periodically. Here you can see the waves of contraction are moving right to left. But periodically the beat slows down, then reverses in direction. Now the waves are moving left to right. Here's the heart beating in a dissected animal. The cylindrical heart is folded in half, so it looks quite complicated. There's an outer cylinder, the pericardium, and the contractile tube, the actual heart, is inside that. And here's another much less active heart, showing the pericardium and the heart folded on itself. The digestive system was pretty easy to follow in these, and so is the reproductive system. This white tissue is testes. It produces sperm that are carried in this white tube, the sperm duct, all the way to its end, which in this species is bright orange. Sperm are released there right below the atrial siphon. The ovary is right here. It's similar in color to the stomach, so it's hard to see at this magnification. Eggs are carried up the oviduct that parallels the sperm duct, and they're released just below the atrial siphon. For orientation, here's the pharynx, esophagus, stomach, and intestine leading up to the rectum and anus, which has some feces dangling from it. Let's clean that up. Here are those testes at higher magnification and the sperm duct. Here's the ovary. You can see that it has some brown dots in it. It leads into the oviduct, which you can see is full of eggs. Here's the ovary at higher magnification. There's the anus, and here is that oviduct full of eggs. Again, the oviduct and that white sperm duct. And here's where they both open. There's sperm leaking from the sperm duct. One more thing to see are parts of the nervous system located right between the oral and atrial siphons. The cerebral ganglion is that bright white structure, and the neural gland is a little horseshoe-shaped structure right next to it. Cyano was nice because it had a translucent tunic, but lots of other local solitary tunicates have opaque tunics. Here are two very common species. Styla clava is the longer orange-colored one and the bigger, lumpier, yellowish one is Styla plicata. You can see several of those on the right bottom corner of this view. Here's Styla clava. It has a long posterior stalk.
I dissected one of these just to see the digestive system, which is a little different than that of Siona. Here's the oral siphon. Here's the pharynx. Here's the esophagus, which leads into the stomach, the intestine, the rectum, and the anus, just under the oral siphon. Here's Styla plicata. This is not a very attractive ascidian. The individual on the left has a colony of compound ascidians growing on it. We'll look at some of those next. It's easy to find compound ascidians in the same fouling communities. Those patches of white dots are colonies of Botryloides diagensis, I believe. And the orange patches on the bottom right of the screen are Botryloides violaceus. Here are four local species, all growing on mussels, except for Batrillus schlosseri on the top right, which is growing on the tunic of a Styla clava. And here is a colony of Batrillus schlosseri. In this species, the zoids are organized in circles. Each zoid has its own oral siphon, but they all share a common atrial siphon in the center of the circle. Each zoid has a few short white oral tentacles protruding into its oral siphon. Presumably those taste incoming water or detect sediment or other particulates in incoming water. You can also see pigmented blood cells flowing in the tunic. We'll look at that more closely in a minute. Here's a nice colony. The video is sped up a bit so you can see colony behavior more easily. And fluorescein, as always, helps to identify flow patterns. I found this mite kind of distracting. Here's another species, Botryloides diagensis. Here the zoids share a common atrial siphon, but they're not organized in circles. Instead, they're in parallel rows. Around the outside of the colony, you see these little fingers of tissue pointing out in the direction the colony is growing. Those are called vascular ampullae, and they help secrete new tunic, and they also play a role in blood circulation, as their name suggests. Here's a colony of Botryloides diagensis with particularly transparent tunic. 
so we can easily see blood vessels and the ampullae. We can't see the hearts in individual zoids here, but we can see blood flow change direction periodically. Focus on some specific section of blood vessel to see that. One thing you may have noticed is blood flowing into the ampullae, then flowing out of the ampullae. When it flows in, ampullae actually get bigger. They then contract as blood exits. This is a lot easier to see when the video is sped up. Focus on the ampullae here and watch them get bigger and then smaller. So maybe they're acting a little bit like peripheral hearts. Here's another species, Botryloides violaceus. Zoids are kind of haphazardly organized in these colonies. Compound dissidians brood their embryos and release planktonic tadpole larvae. Like in bryozoans, they often release larvae at first light. I kept these colonies in the dark overnight, then gave them an artificial sunrise. I only got a few tadpoles from the Botryloides violaceus. Here's one. And here they are at higher magnification. In this lighting, you can see that there are a bunch of ampullae pointing forward. The central brown mass is what will form the initial zoids, and it will be surrounded by ampullae on the substratum. At the very anterior tip of the larva, there are three adhesive papillae, of which I can see two, that the larva will use to stick itself onto the settlement site. Here's a larva in more detail. It has a functional heart already. The part of the tail with the very large cells between the line of orange dots dorsally and the line of black dots ventrally is the notochord. At metamorphosis, the larva attaches with the three papillae, then it pulls the tail tissue back in. Here's some sped up video showing tail withdrawal. The tissue will be resorbed, but the tunic of the tail will be shed. 
At the same time, the ampullae are starting to extend out. You can see that they are already involved in blood circulation. Here it is in different lighting after shedding the tunic of the tail. Larvae of Botryloides are very large and opaque, so it's hard to see many internal structures. Here's a smaller, more translucent tadpole. It's much easier to see the three adhesive papillae at the anterior end. You can also see the two siphons pointing to the larva's dorsal side. The anterior one will be the oral siphon, the posterior one will be the atrial siphon. Between the two siphons are a brown photoreceptor and a black spherical statolith. 